Hello, John, another retro tech guy here. So in uh, two previous videos, we took a look at my Macintosh 2SI here. And today we're returning to it to finally address the graphics issue that we saw then, among other things. So let's get on with it. In the first video, we saw the 2SI with the impressive Macintosh portrait display. And in the second video, I was reliving some 90s childhood memories with the help of an external CD drive hooked up. Links to those are in the description. In both of those, however, um, we could see some serious jail bars on the screen. First, I didn't know if it was the monitor or the computer, but the um, display worked well hooked up to a PowerBook 160. So the fault was with the computer and I just assumed that it was a question of recapping the logic board. The capacitors did look rather crusty, especially under the power supply, even though there wasn't any obvious leakage. As we saw in the previous video, to my despair, my recapping did nothing to the problem of the jail bars. I did however discover that the bars disappeared when I changed to display colors. Although some multimedia I tried still displayed distortion in color mode. So something was wrong with the graphics. In the comments to that video, a viewer wrote of having experienced the exact same problem and gave a detailed account of how it was fixed. I'm no expert on board level repairs and I find schematics somewhat overwhelming, but I decided to give it a go and try to fix this rather annoying graphics issue. First things first though, um, when I got the 2SI, I was told that the power supply never works. I was pretty pleased that mine did and uh, I focused my energy on the logic board because of the graphics problem. Of course that didn't solve it and uh, so I began to wonder if maybe an unreliable power supply could cause it. That seemed extremely unlikely though no matter how sketchy 2SI power supplies with 30 year old caps are. I've been putting off recapping the PSU but uh, now when I finally have decided to address the graphics issue the PSU seemed to want my attention first. The computer won't start at all, which is of course worse than before. I assume it is the PSU, although one never knows with old computers. I've ordered some replacement caps, so um, let's finally get this recapped and hope it does the trick. In the previous videos, I show how I take this power supply out. But to open the power supply, you just really need to remove that top screw going to remove the uh, bottom screw here as well because uh, it holds that front uh, connector piece in place as we'll see. And, uh, when that top one is removed you can just open it um, by lifting the top. I usually get my nails terribly stuck in there and that might hurt so I'm using this uh, plastic tool to just pry this right off and uh, yeah, there you go. This is the front that comes off then because I removed that bottom screw and uh, then we have to unscrew the screws that holds the PCB in place. Just have to remove the screws that uh, connect to ground here on the side of the power supply. And then we have three screws holding down the PCB into the cage that we need to remove. The connector that connects to the logic board there has these plastic wings that need to be squeezed together to and push through the the metal um, in order to get the uh, the PCB out of course. There, you just press it through, and then with some uh, wriggling, more wiggling. We should get this thing out. Uh, 
have to flex the sides of the power supply cage a little bit in order to get the PCB out. And here we have it then, the uh, connector there on front, on the front, and um, if you look at the underneath, it has quite a lot of flux residue left on it. It's kind of shiny, sticky surface there underneath, but uh, there's some black there as well, but it doesn't look too bad. Little one, another one, two big ones, there's a little one in the middle. There is one, another one hiding there under the cables as well. There's a lot of glue between some of them there. There's a little board with more of them and uh, behind here as well with glue. So this needs to go out for us to change the capacitors there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, mark all the caps with my green marker here so I can see which ones I've uh, replaced and which ones I haven't. I don't actually plan to replace the two big ones there in the middle. They should be safe as I understand it, but uh, I'll mark them anyway to uh, show that they are the uh, original ones and that they haven't been changed in case I come back to this one. There should be um, 11 through holes that I intend to change and uh, to um, surface mounts. Of course the uh, two big ones there are also through hole but I won't change them so in total there should be 15 caps on this board. I'm removing these caps with my soldering iron and our solder sucker. I uh, did have a desoldering gun once but uh, Got kind of clogged up and uh, it just wasn't worth the hassle and the space that it was taking. I guess for some kind of jobs you really do need one but um, I find that this does the trick. They also use um, solder wick as we'll see to suck up the final bits but uh, yeah the solder sucker does a surprisingly good job I think. With through hole caps you can just sort of heat it up, suck some solder and then pull on one of the legs at the time to squeeze it out one by one and uh, it seems to work here. And then I just use some solder braid to get the last of the solder off there at the back to make space for new caps. I try to clean off any flux residue with some isopropyl alcohol. Underneath. and uh, also under where the cap was. This one wasn't too bad, but uh, some of the others probably will be. There's a great feeling dropping a fresh cap in an old uh, PCB. Um, I just have to uh, get the polarity right. Of course, the long leg is the plus and uh, negative is marked on the side of the cap usually and also on the board here we can actually see the plus and the minus I just pop it in and then uh, solder on the back I use some of that flux paste there for heat transfer and I put it uh, next to the board by the legs I'm using lead-free solder, which I know is probably terrible, but uh, I haven't actually used leaded solder, and I don't want to start using it because uh, I might like it too much. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so this doesn't work great, but uh, it does work. And uh, of course it would be better if it melted at uh, lower temperatures and such, but this has worked so far and uh, it's probably healthier. 
I don't know why I didn't think of this before, but uh, this is actually connected with the connectors. So we can take this front bit off and uh, the board will be much easier to handle. So this was too much of a struggle to actually catch on camera, but uh, I managed to remove this little daughter board with the surface mount uh, caps on. And uh, it was actually glued, hot glued to the caps behind it. As you can see, I had to cut through the um, glue and uh, took a part of the caps behind it off as well. But I finally managed to get them off. I did lose one of the little legs though, and uh, I'm hoping to be able to solder it back on that might not be easy so i realized that i didn't order a 47 microfarad 25 volt through hole cap so i had to be creative here and make this surface mount cap into a through hole cap so i got the caps installed there behind the daughter board and uh, yeah they seem to fit now let's hope they actually work as well i don't have a hot air gun and um, the solder iron does little to remove surface mount caps in my experience, so I'm going to use some pliers and just wriggle this until it comes loose. But you want to be gentle because if the pads are corroded and damaged by the capacitor juice, they might lift and then you're in for trouble. Ooh, and these are crusty looking pads. Wow, I'm happy that I'm recapping this now. It's got to be good. I'm removing the legs from the surface mount caps with my solder iron and some uh, tweezers. But uh, then I uh, put some more flux and uh, the solder braid to remove any left on solder. And then of course it's the isopropyl alcohol. Got one of these 1200 microfarad caps off and uh, just look underneath of this this is really bad this has leaked big time and uh, this may very well be causing the problem if the leakage on the uh, daughter board didn't do it it was also hot glued to the other caps it's pretty hard to get off but uh, here it is and we can see the goo there on the board underneath the cap as well get this cleaned off and uh, it'll be like new with a new cap. This 2200 microfarad cap was also terrible. As you can see here it really leaked. And uh, in fact the whole cluster there on the corner of the board uh, looked pretty terrible. I wonder if uh, components are especially hot here and that's why they fail. So I realized that I actually have several caps that I'm lacking, not only that cap that I made uh, from an SMD cap, but uh, all the ones with the green there, except the big ones that I won't swap. And I'll get a real through hole cap for behind the daughter board there while I'm at it. Of course, we have to solder the surface mount caps to the daughter board and get that stuck in there as well. But I have to get this leg onto the daughter board before we continue. I made several attempts at this and it kept coming off. So this was not easy. And uh, it has like a little leg that's supposed to go on the back as well, but that kind of came off. I was just hoping to solder it straight to the daughter board um, without holding it on the back as the other pins are. I'm afraid that uh, when I solder the daughter board onto the PCB um, it may come loose again with the heat so I'm hoping it won't. Ah, there finally, now it seems to be well stuck on. 
It looks pretty good as well. So I finally got the caps that I ordered that I was missing. And uh, so here we have them. We have the caps here for the front corner. We have the little cap that goes between the big caps there in the middle. We have the SMD cap for the daughter board that I also was missing. And um, then we have the through hole cap that will replace the homemade SMD version that I made there behind the uh, daughter board. Okay, so now I have put all the new caps back in their places and uh, managed to get the PCB back in the cage again. And uh, here we can see all the caps in the right place. And as you can see, the only ones with green markings are now the big chunky caps that are in the middle that uh, won't need replacing. So hopefully this power supply is good to go for another 30 years, I'm hoping. Uh, it looks rather neat. So now let's just close this up and uh, see if it uh, made the computer turn on. I really hope so. But before that, let's just uh, admire this lineup of bad guys. As you can see, it's predominantly the big caps that uh, have leaked. The little ones, not so much, although some of them do look a bit crusty. And as we can see, the surface mount caps on the daughter board were quite terrible. Well, taking the state of these, I'm really hopeful that this was indeed what caused the computer not to start. I doubt it would fix the graphics issue though. All right then, here goes nothing. Yay, it starts right up, awesome. So the power supply is working once again. Ah, but look at that. The graphics issue is still present, of course. So, um, yep, that's the next thing to tackle. Now that the computer actually starts, we are kind of back to square one. Although no more lingering bad conscience about the power supply. But uh, now I can actually start uh, attempting to fix the graphics issue. These are the instructions here. The viewer wrote, had this exact same issue on my 2SI. The problem was a broken trace under a leaking capacitor from the multiplexer chips to the video controller. With a monochrome image, you can count which bit is affected and look up the pins on the affected chips. Search for Bowmark Macintosh 2SI schematics. Since this is a big Indian machine, you count from 31 down to zero. In the video, it looks as if bit zero is the culprit, as I can't see a bright line to the far right of the screen. Use a multimeter and check continuity between pin two of UE5, the multiplexer, and pin one of UF7, RAM chip, and between pin two of UE5 and pin 90 of UA3 video controller. Then use a botch wire or carefully follow the trace to repair the breakage. You can't see the problem in 256 grayscale mode because bit zero is the least significant one and you can't really see the difference between those shades of gray. Here are the mentioned Bowmark schematics, link in the description. So here we have the multiplexer UE5 and we can see that uh, pin two goes to pin one of the RAM chip UF7. So I'll check for continuity there. Then we see a zero here, which I guess must be referring to bit zero. If we go down to pin 90 of the video controller UA3. We see a zero there as well. I'm no expert at this, but uh, from what I gather, there's supposed to be continuity also between uh, this pin 90 and the pin two of the multiplexer. So I'll be checking for that. I put a silver sticker there on the three chips that we'll be looking at. And I wrote down here what uh, I need to check between them. UE5, the multiplexer is there. 
UE7, the RAM chip is there. And UA3, the video controller is up there. I made a mark also on the sticker so I easily can find pin 90 on the video controller and pin 2 of the multiplexer. So I'm starting to test the continuity between the multiplexer pin 2 and uh, the RAM chip there, pin 1. Yes, there is continuity. That's good news. So if this is the issue, then, then uh, the break must be on the other line. I'm testing between the multiplexer now, pin 2, and uh, the video controller, pin 90, but uh, there is no beep. So no continuity there. So that does confirm that there is a fault somewhere between those two. There's a break somewhere. So uh, yeah, the diagnosis was right. Now let's see if we can find where the issue lies and fix it. All right, look at this. I found continuity from a VIA that clearly is supposed to go to the pin two of the multiplexer and pin 90 of the video controller. If I can solder a bulge wire from that VIA to pin two of the multiplexer, then uh, we should have uh, continuity all the way from the multiplexer to the video controller. I'm trying to see where the trace is damaged, but I can't and unfortunately I don't have a microscope. But um, I'll be soldering this uh, enameled thin copper wire as a bodge between the uh, via and the pin. Uh, the pin here and uh, the via there. Okay, the bodge wire is in place, so moment of truth. Will there be continuity all the way between the multiplexer and the video controller? Yes, excellent, awesome. I'm really crossing my fingers that this will solve the graphics issue. Here's a close up of the bulge wire. It's not the prettiest job, but uh, not too bad and apparently good enough. The wire is coated, but uh, I did cover it with some capped on tape to make sure nothing shorts and uh, so that I don't get caught in it. Here it is, back in the case with the power supply there on top. The brake must have been right by pin 2 of uh, UE5, the multiplexer, but uh, I can't really see how that happened. So, second moment of truth then. Have we fixed the issue with the annoying jail bars in black and white and grayscale? Ah, it actually works. Wow, that is almost incredible. Thank you so much, viewer, I Pushke. No bars, and we are in black and white mode now. Wow, I'm gonna let this start up and uh, check grayscale and color also. Yep, grayscale works as well, no bars. And color as well. Uh, we didn't see much of uh, issues with color before, but uh, there was some some distortions. But now everything looks great. This is so cool. Now that I have a Macintosh 2SI that works so well, I want to do something about the yellowing on the case. I've had some success on uh, small scale with old ADB mice. Link to that in the description. But I've also possibly overdone it in the past, so I'm a bit afraid of record writing. This keyboard was extremely yellowed, as you can see here. Of course, the caps are different plastic, but uh, this is how it looked under the Apple logo. I applied hydrogen peroxide cream and left it in the sun on the windowsill inside with cling film on for four to five hours. You can see the result here. Um, that was clearly a bit too much. There are some slight signs of streaking here also and of miscoloration. Although maybe if I try uh, retrobiting the keys too uh, and uh, the bottom then it will look okay. 
I've also successfully recuperated uh, keys for a Commodore 128, but uh, that was in a bag of water and liquid hydrogen peroxide. Also a link in the description. I have three issues. One, I have no liquid hydrogen peroxide, only the cream variant. Two, the computer case is too big to put on the windowsill. And three, on my balcony, there is only some direct sunlight in the evening. I read that someone had successfully retrobrighted with cream on the balcony uh, without direct sunlight. So I uh, decided to try to learn from my mistakes and take it very slowly. I applied a thin layer of hydrogen peroxide cream with a paintbrush and made sure that uh, it was an even layer. Then I put uh, cling film on top and made sure that uh, there weren't any creases or air bubbles. Then I kept it in the light on the balcony, but out of direct sunlight for uh, five to six hours. The temperature wasn't warm even, uh, just around 20 degrees Celsius, about uh, 68 Fahrenheit. I just did one side at the time so I would get uh, the application of cream and the cling film right and I rinsed it off thoroughly and dried it before I did it again on another side. So I did one side at a time, uh, which with the top was four sides. On one side I had to repeat the process twice because it was quite yellowed. So this was not a quick fix and it took several days. I actually left the bottom half as it is for comparison and as you can see the retro brighting uh, without sunlight was pretty effective. Compare the uh, 2SI here with the Quadro 700 there on the left under the SE. I am very pleased with this. Living as I do, this is definitely a method I will be returning to. I have a spare parts Macintosh SE uh, that would be the ideal test object for uh, results on a larger scale. Now with a computer that uh, looks rather bright, and uh, actually starts, I thought we should test the graphics fix also with uh, this Peter Rabbit storybook to make sure this thing really is fixed in color. As you could see in the previous video, there were clear distortions when showing the pictures in this book. Much worse than it looked in Finder where the issue was hardly visible in color. Wow, yeah, look at this. No sign of any graphics issue. No lines and no distortions at all. That's awesome. Funny thing, the hard drive actually gave up on me while I was testing it after the fix. That's life, I guess, um, as long as I insist on using original hardware. This could, of course, be a great excuse to replace it with the blue SCSI, but I actually have the same type of uh, 80 megabyte hard drive available from a Performa 400 that I'm struggling to get going. The 2SI had a pretty oddly customized Swedish System 7 on it. Um, that I tried to use, but uh, everything would freeze up whenever I opened SCSI Director, so I did a fresh install with English System 7.1 on the new hard drive. I'm so thankful to the viewer that provided the solution to my graphics problem. With that fixed and the PSU recapped and the case retrobrighted, this is coming together as a great machine. As I've mentioned before, I do really like this case design. This may actually not be the last installment in uh, what is now a 2SI series, I guess. I recently came across something that uh, might just take this thing to the next level. Please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already, so you won't miss that when it comes out. And um, if you've enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate if you give it a thumbs up. Take care and thank you for watching.